So we're going to go ahead and start with our study session um, this evening. And we're going to be talking about uh, COVID-19 and virtual um, instruction discussion. Uh, starting us off this evening is Dr. Craig Gilbert. And then we will also hear from Mr. Frank Narducci and Mr. Larry Rother. I'm, I'm oh, I'm sorry. Um, Dr. Castile is going to start. <laughs> Thank you, Madam President, members of the board. Recent, the recent increases in COVID cases has reignited the debate about schools. Do we stay open for in-person? Do we close or transition to virtual, hybrid, online, all of the above? We've received hundreds of emails and comments, and I know the board has. And I can assure the community we have received and read all your emails, even shared them with one another. Some are supporting and some are criticizing, so we get it all. And I assure you that the, uh, those of you that write the board on comments for this evening are all shared and, and there for the uh, board to read. The volume has precluded many of us from responding to all of them, but I, I, I just want to assure the community we are reading them and taking note. Tonight, the administration wants to present our plan moving forward as the COVID cases increase in the county. First of all, we want to assure the staff, parents, and community that we are closely watching the national, state, county, zip code, and district data all the benchmarks. In addition, we are tracking our site-specific data because we believe that is a critical piece of the information. We're continuing to revisit and reinforce our mitigation strategies as the pandemic fatigue sets in. And we know that fatigue has set in when it comes to wearing masks and staying distanced. And uh, we're, I just don't think all, it, we're all diligent like we were several weeks ago. So I certainly want to encourage the community and the staff to um, recommit to those uh, strategies, those mitigation strategies. We will be meeting with state and health department officials uh, on Friday in a meeting. And we're going to be exploring on-site testing solutions for staff and students. And it would be that 15-minute test similar to ASU. Uh, we might have the opportunity to be part of a pilot here in the district. And we're looking forward to that information. And we'll look forward to uh, updating you. This evening, Dr. Gilbert, Mr. Narducci, and Mr. Rother will present our plan and the rationale behind it. At the end of the study session, we aren't kidding ourselves. Um, we know that there will be a number of you upset, maybe angry, continued frustration. Some of you will be relieved and happy and pleased. I'm hoping that you will all feel informed and realize that we are not taking this pandemic lightly, but trying to make decisions by including district and site specific data so we know how it is directly impacting our, our very specific local community. So with that, I'm going to turn it over. Dr. Gilbert will start us off. Madam President, members of the board, thank you for this opportunity to share this information with you. Um, with the district's intent to focus on a localized approach to addressing COVID-19 spread in the COSD community, this presentation will review benchmarks and learning scenarios, review Maricopa County data, provide perspective of district zip code um, area data, review successful mitigation strategies, review our COSD COVID-19 data, discuss in-person learning, and then provide a COSD plan to determine when to move a site or site to temporary virtual learning. What I'd like to do is first I start by reviewing the benchmarks and the learning scenarios. We've had discussions um, previously. So just as a review, when we look at the community spread benchmarks, going from minimal risk to substantial risk, you will see that the focus in the benchmarks is cases, percent positivity, COVID-like illness. When you look at the minimal risk, it's below 10 cases per 100,000, below 5% for percent positivity, below 5% for COVID-like illness. When we look at moderate, it's 10 to 100 cases 
per 100,000, between 5 and 10 percent for positive, between 5 and 10 percent for COVID-like illness, and then for substantial, it's above 100 cases per 100,000. Percent positivity is above 10 percent, and COVID-like illness above 10 percent. So when we look at the definitions, just, to, just as a follow-up, our case rate, this is the number of people infected with COVID-19 per 100,000 people in a selected area. Percent positivity, this is the percentage of PCR diagnostic tests confirmed positive out of all tests performed in the selected area, being the PCR test is the, uh, I believe it's the uh, nose swab. COVID-like illness percentage of hospital visits. This information comes from the surveillance system that monitors the percent of people who visit emergency rooms and hospitals with symptoms of COVID-19. So the, the, what you see before you now is looking at the learning scenarios um, for the county benchmarks. You will see that this is the area or the um, document that was changed um, in the county that I think is important to note. You will see that in the red area, which is the substantial area, which is high, in order to move to virtual learning in the new, new uh, documentation from the county, is all three benchmarks are in red before you move to virtual and on-site. This is different from what it was previous. And previous was the focus is moving to moving from being in virtual, moving to in-person. And so to move to in-person, it was if you had one red in an area, you couldn't move up to the next. If you had one yellow in an area, you couldn't move up uh, to the next, um, to the green. I think it's real important because the main focus at that time and all the documentation that it came out was, how do you move from virtual to in-person? The new data, the new focus and the new directives, the new guidelines, really focuses now on we are in the area of being in person. Now, how do you move if you move to a virtual model or a hybrid model? So this was the area that was changed. You'll see you have a recommendation for resuming in-person learning. This is where we currently are. We're in in-person learning, this in-person learning. Um, this is what we've talked about many times as to what needs to occur if you're moving from virtual to in-person learning over a two-week period is really what the, the, the focus is of when you're going to change from something, you're looking at something occurring over a two-week period. So I'm not going to continue to cover this, but this is information that we've shared. I wanted to make sure that you had this so that you can refer back to it when you're looking at what does that mean for going to in-person learning. I think this slide here is the important piece when you look at what has changed. When you look at the recommendations for considering returning to virtual learning, this is new. This was not in the documentation in the initial plans because it hadn't come out from the county as to what it looks like when you're going from virtual or from in-person to virtual. We had started in virtual and then moved on. So important to look at in, in this slide is going into the bullets in this area. What you see is if school district or other defined school area has one or more benchmarks in the substantial category for two or more weeks, schools should consult with the Maricopa County Department of Public Health to determine whether, a, whether to prepare to transition back to virtual learning with onset supports. Mr. Gil Dr. Gilbert, if I could tell the board and the community, the, this PowerPoint was inadvertently not posted it is now posted. You might have to refresh your computer and it'll come up on your computer. I apologize to the community, but this will be available online now. And if they are, and if they are following along, we are currently on slide eight. Next, if a school district or other defined school area has all three benchmarks in the substantial category, public health recommends schools transition to virtual learning with on-site support services so that, these are the two pieces I think are very important. Prior again, moving from virtual to in-person, now this focuses on moving from in-person to virtual. The change that, um, that has been the conversation is having to be in red for all three benchmarks before you go to virtual. One of the conversations that was at the last board meeting was 
I believe by Mrs. Love, asked, what does that mean for us? And one of the things I shared was, we've had a plan in place and we would stay the course. And I think it's very important to clarify what that meant. We were already as a district looking at what is going to occur after having two weeks in a red category. And in that third week, looking to see what was that measure? What was coming from the county as to what our district looked like? At that time, it was making sure that once we get that information, determining what our next steps were. It wasn't an automatic one way or the other because everything that we've had from documentation wasn't what do you do and how you're going to move back. So as a district, we've been having conversations to say with this happening, what is our next step? What does that look like? So I think it's important to note when we look at what has come out from the, the county and what we've been doing as a district. We've been monitoring our data for some time. With that being said, when we look at the Maricopa County data, a couple things I wanna share, and this slide came from the COVID-19 return to school update, which was on November 12th, and it was um, hosted by the Maricopa County Public Health. You will see in this slide, the peak that you see is early on in June, July, to now early uh, November. But what I really wanna put your, um, have your eyes look to, and that is the graph to the bottom left, which really gets into focusing on of the cases in Maricopa County, what are the age groups that are affected? And so when you look down, you'll see zero to 19, 14%, 20 to, to 44 years of age, 49%, 45 to 64 years of age, 26%. When you look at the total number of cases that are in Maricopa County, other than those that are 65 and above, the, the next group that is affected the lowest, not meaning that they're not affected, but affected the lowest would be that group that is from age zero to 19. In this next slide, also from county data, I wanted to be able to show you what we're seeing currently. You'll see to the left of this slide, this is June, July of where we're at our peak. And you'll see to the far right is November. And at this particular one, it's November 7th. I know there is a November 14th that is out there on the um, county website that still shows that trend going up. It's not going down, it's still going up. And we can see that um, through this. But I think what's important is to note is where we are, understanding that we have to watch our data and the trend is moving in an upward direction. Now, I think it's important, again, in, in making sure that we're transparent so people can see exactly what are we looking at when we're looking at data for our district. I think this is an important slide because this really gives us the zip code and broad picture of our district. You'll see that there's red and yellow throughout this area. Is it all of our district? No, but there's some key, key areas here. We have to remember that we are a district of 80 square miles. With that being said, you'll see that we have red in some of our areas and we have yellow in some of our areas from in this 85142 area of Castile to the 85225 to Chandler High to the 85248 of, of Hamilton High School. And I just use those as landmarks so you can see the spread that we have from our district. But I think it's important when you, you, we look at this information, it really is on the, sur on the surface. So we need to be able to look and see the, the full picture. So I think it's important that we peel back this first layer of the zip codes within our district and, and break it down a little, a little more. Understanding that within our district, we have a number of zip codes. So if we start with 85297, you can see that in this, you will see in the red, we have cases per 100,000 is red for two weeks, which is why of having a red in two weeks, you will see that there's substantial and it's, taught, it, it's saying prepare for virtual. But you also see that there's still some yellow and green in this last week. Now this is starting with last week's data that was on the 12th. The next um, data that will be presented um, by the county will be tomorrow. So we'll see what that data looks like. But when you look at this chart, you'll see that cases per 100 is in, in red and it's been red for the last two weeks. You also see that percent positivity has increased from 4.9 to 8.47, which is now in the yellow. I share that so you can see this, in, in this particular um, zip code, you will see two reds. 
because there are two reds in, that zip, in this zip code, that zip code is going to show as red. If we move to the next area, which is 85224, you will see that there is only one week, which was last week, in the red area, which is the case per 100,000. It wasn't in the previous week. You'll also see that the percent positivity did increase from 4.6 to 8.2. But because it has only been one week um, with, in this area, it's not red on our map. So understanding why is there a red or not a red also comes down to what are you seeing within that area um, for the percent positive or the 100 per 100,000. And you still see that there are some, there are some green as we look at the COVID-like illness. So then when we move to 85249, again, you still have um, one red. The possibility, depending on tomorrow's data, could be a second week of red, which then could make this area red. Currently, it is not. You'll see that there has been an increase in percent positivity from 3.4 to 6.8. So we'll see what tomorrow's data brings us. And then finally, you'll see that 85248, there's no red. So if there's red in their area of, of cases per 100,000, it will be their first week in red. And it wouldn't be to the following week if they're red again that that would become a red area. Real important because you can see that different parts of our district, depending on where the zip code is, depends on where you fall and what's happening in the community. But we can't just focus on the, what's happening in, in regards to that particular community because we know within our district, 30, uh, at least 30% of the population open enrolls to another area that's not within their boundary. So it's not so simple that you can just focus on a zip code. So that's why I wanted to also show you this, this slide, which is the district over the last five weeks. You will see that you have red in the per 100,000, and that's been the last two weeks, which is why the district turned red. Now understand that this is the district data comes from the collective of all of the zip codes. But if you have anywhere in your, in your district where you have some, a, a location that has moved from yellow to red because they've had two weeks of that data, it puts the district in red. So I think it's real important when you're looking at the district picture, you can't just figure that the whole district is sitting in the same spot, but the district is a collective. So you will see in, on uh, October 15th, we had two greens and a yellow as it relates to where the district was. December 29th, we're still there. Some increase, but not much. We get to November 5th, and that's where you'll see our first, first measure in the district where there was red, and that was per 100,000 um, 100, know, in regards to that red. Then we moved into last week, and you have per 100,000, which gave us two reds, but you still have two yellows in the percent positivity, and two greens in COVID-like illness. So when you look at the data, you can see that it would, it would make you really need to look at all the data from a perspective if you were going to make any decisions. That's why the, in the start of this conversation, it was really looking at localized how you're going to address it because not every area within our district looks the same. We understand that there, the trend is moving up and we have to address that and make sure that we're following that information. But we have to understand that early on when we had our presentation from our, um, from our person from the county, the goal was we looked at where we are for two weeks. We would get into the third week and see what is that data telling us and we would have conversations and have a plan, but we wouldn't have a knee jerk reaction as to automatically make any particular decision. So when we look at where are we from a global perspective of our district and then narrowing it down into where we are um, as it relates to the zip codes or our school, I think that's where we need to really look at the data that we have. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Rother. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert, uh, members of the governing board, Dr. Castile. Um, 
Before I jump into some slides about our individual sites and how COVID-19 has affected our, our schools, uh, I just want to reiterate something that, that Dr. Gilbert spoke to, is that prior to opening schools for in-person, we had county uh, data to go on. Now that we've opened schools and been open since September 14th, we now have some site data to look at. And we also know the, the mitigation strategies that we've put in place. So it's important as we look at uh, our in-person learning that we take a look specifically at the school sites and that data and also our mitigation strategies. So here's our current mitigation strategies. <clears throat> we, as you know, we've increased the frequency of disinfecting and sanitizing our hard surfaces at our schools. We have an increased focus on hand hygiene. And as you all know, we have sanitation stations in every room. Uh, teachers have been great and principals have been great about reminding students to wash their hands when they come in from breaks and at numerous times during the day. Social distancing protocols are in place where possible. Cohorting, especially at the elementary schools and limited social interaction in classrooms in common areas is taking place. Obviously, we have adequate ventilation and air filtration systems in our schools. Uh, we're currently contact tracing, so we are doing that through our health services department. Um, and quarantining protocols are in place for students that come into close contact with students who are positive. And the final two I wanna stress, because they, they truly are important to our mitigation strategies, the first is the parent support that we've gotten thus far about making sure that they check in with their students and keep six students at home. Uh, that's the number one way to prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our schools is to ensure that if students are sick, that parents are keeping those students home and monitoring their symptoms and getting them tested if possible. And then finally, the mandatory face covering policy, which uh, we've implemented since students have been back in person. There has been some new research on that. Uh, the CDC's updated its uh, research regarding face masks. And uh, I'm not gonna read this whole thing to you, but I underlined what I think is probably the most important statement there is, the prevention benefits of masking is derived from the combination of source control and personal protection for the mask wearer. So prior to this, there was, it was um, unclear as whether or not masks uh, helped stop the spread for both the person wearing it to spread those droplets and also uh, how well did it protect someone who's wearing a mask from inhaling those droplets. And so now the CDC is supporting mask wearing as a preventative measure for both someone who may be infected and from spreading and also protecting a person who, who's healthy from um, transmitting, the, the, transmitting the virus. So we know that masks work and we're gonna continue that policy. So now let's take a look at the, CD, the CUSD schools and COVID by the numbers and take a look at how COVID-19 is affecting um, our campuses. So what I have here is a cumulative positive cases reported on CUSD campuses since we resumed in-person instruction on September 14th. Uh, the total number of staff is 46 out of approximately 5,000 staff and that's a positivity rate of 0 0.01. Total students in person, and that's 178 of the approximate 38,000 students that are attending our schools in person. That's a positivity rate of 0 0.05. And then we've also added the total students in our Chandler Online Academy, and that's our 100% virtual option for students, and 28 uh, out of the approximately 6,000 students attending Chandler Online Academy full time, and that's a positivity rate of 0 0.05. What's interesting about this is that, as you can see, the positivity rate in the Chandler Online Academy, so these are students that have never stepped foot on our campus, they're at home learning virtually, is the same positivity rate as students that are attending in person. And so we know COVID is in our community, um, and uh, we know it's in our school as well, and we're doing what we can to mitigate that. But it's interesting to see that the positivity rate is the same, both for students attending virtually and in person. Um, we're also reporting per schools how many positive cases uh, have been reported. Again, cumulative. The number of schools reporting at least one positive case has been 35 of our schools. The number of schools without any positive cases reported has been 10 of our schools. And currently, the number of schools without an active positive case is 32. So two out of three of our schools uh, currently do not have any positive cases reported on their campus. This is the updated dashboard. 
And um, as you know, this has gone through a little bit of a facelift within the last week or so. Uh, this is updated daily on our website. It has the total number of employees and students at each site, the confirmed active cases, the percentage of active cases, and then the total resolved cases. And so um, I've had some, some questions regarding, uh, we've all had some questions regarding active cases and what that looks like and, and how, a, how a, a case would get to this dashboard. And an active case is a case in which uh, we have documentation from the parent of a positive test or documentation from Maricopa County of a positive test. Once we get that documentation, then we initiate our contract contact tracing and then that number gets posted on our dashboard. And so um, currently, if you were to check our dashboard as of right now, uh, again, I reported what that positivity rate looks like at the schools. Five of our schools are reporting uh, three or more cases. And of those five schools, four out of the five are our secondary schools. We do have one elementary school that's reporting more than three cases. So overall, relatively, um, overall, the, the active cases um, haven't reached that, you know, aren't, aren't over that three number for the most part. Now let's take a look at our quarantine data. Um, obviously, as we have positive cases on our campus, that doesn't just affect the student that's positive, it affects those students for which they come into close contact with. So we wanted to provide some information, again, on the cumulative numbers of students that have been quarantined since we resumed in-person instruction on September 14th. We have 112 students at the elementary level, 303 at the junior high level, and 1,461 at the high school level for a total of 1,876 students, and that's as of today, who we have needed to quarantine due to their close contact exposure uh, with students that were positive. So I wanted to add on there as well that the total number of students testing positive while quarantined uh, due to close contact with a positive student was nine. So one of the questions we know that you've gotten and we've gotten as well is how many students when we've quarantined them have actually ended up testing positive. And so we have had nine students that have ended up testing positive while on quarantine. Um, the total number of staff testing positive after their close contact with students on our campuses um, is zero. So we have not, um, we have not been notified of any of our staff that due to close contact with a student on our campus have tested positive. Now I want to caveat this number to make sure that we're all aware that uh, this is just data. And so obviously, uh, when we've quarantined these students, it's not to say that some of these students may not have been asymptomatic. Uh, some of these students may not have had mild symptoms that they didn't get tested. Um, the other thing it shows as well is that the nine students who ended up positive while on quarantine doesn't necessarily mean that they contracted that or transmitted that due to their close contact with a student on our campus. Obviously, this is data and um, a piece of data that we've been asked several questions about, so we thought important that you had it. Uh, to summarize this, <clears throat> our early CUSD data does not indicate that COVID-19 is being transmitted on our campuses really at any substantial rate. So when we take a look at the overall district and school data picture, I think it's important to outline the, the following things. First, the district metrics that were in red um, as shared by Dr. Gilbert, is not representative of the COVID-19 incidents on our campus. Early school data suggests transmission rates in our schools do not mirror the transition rates in the community. Now, the next two bullets might be uh, the driving force behind the first two. So staff and students have been following our mitigation strategies that appear to be preventing the spread of COVID-19 on our campuses. And obviously, as I shared before, masking up matters. Uh, the new CDC research confirms the importance of, of wearing a mask. So overall, when we take a look at Maricopa County and our district data, along with the specific school site data, it does suggest a more localized approach to school closures. And so with that, we'd like to share our plan for continued in-person instruction and then share the targeted temporary site closures if necessary. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gilbert. Thank you. So Mr. Rother was able to share that data with you. It's important to know that there's a lot of information that we need to take into account when making these decisions. We look at the numbers of uh, positive cases on campus, the number of students that 
or quarantined, but we also need to look at in maintaining in-person learning, what we're seeing is the successful mitigation strategies occurring, whether it's face coverings, hand washing, cleaning that is happening in the classrooms, in the hallways. Quality of instruction is stronger in a face -to with face-to-face -face opportunities for students. Average daily attendance and student engagement is higher in a face-to-face. -face. Interventions and tutoring have greater impact when a teacher is able to work with that, that student directly and in person. Cohorting of student groups help maintain stability. Same classroom groups, for example, in elementary. Currently, um, percentage of school cases are lower than community percentages. Social emotional supports available for all students and staff at the site. Able to better meet the needs of special education students, as well as maintain employment for support staff, such as food and nutrition workers, bus drivers, classrooms, paras. Eliminating in-person learning, more opportunity for community spread with more unstructured time. One thing we do know is when school starts to when school ends, they are at a location that is being mitigated. We're working as hard as we can to keep them as distant as possible, wearing masks and cleaning, where when they're not at school, where will they be? Hopefully at home, but possibly in the community, hanging out with other friends, doing other things. Technology or access divide across student and environments we know has been an issue in talking with parents. Instruction may have reduced uh, student-teacher interaction. What can, what can be done over, over technology um, becomes difficult for some students to connect. Average daily attendance is lower due to uh, limited engagement. Also, finding kids that we're trying to connect with because of going to virtual. Making sure that we are getting, in, getting to everyone who needs to be at school, but at times having difficulty finding where they are. Less control mitigation strategies from a, uh, from a district level as no consistent uh, cohorts available, as I mentioned. Research shows online school is more difficult for students in, gr in grades K-3. Parents are not instructional specialists. We've had conversations. Limited on-demand feedback for assistance when parents are trying to help or siblings are trying to help their younger sibling and not having the ability. Excludes or limits students from social emotional supports. Isolation from peers at home, limited social interactions, limited access of social workers and counselors. Um, I know that there was a presentation recently from the state superintendent and, and she shared that there was in, in Arizona 31 uh, suicides by students last year and this year we're already up to 47. I think it's an important number to note. Virtual learning does not meet needs of, of some special education students and then the impact on parents' um, ability to be present at home um, when students are at home. So with that, I will then turn over to Mr. Narducci. Thank you, Dr. Gilbert. Madam President, members of the board, based upon the localized data and actual impacts to our students, staff, and school communities, we're recommending the following plan to tra transition to temporary virtual scenario when a school or schools reach confirmed active positive COVID-19 cases among staff and students. Important to note that that number would be staff and student cases. Our plan would, includes a percentage of active COVID-19 cases um, to move a site to the temporary virtual model. The percentages we've come up with for elementary schools are 2% active cases at that particular site. For junior high schools, Thank you, Craig. For junior high schools, 1.5%, and for high schools, 1%. Exceptions may be made for our alternative sites. As you know, our alternative sites are quite smaller, and so we would look at what those cases are there and make a, a, a decision that may reflect more of that 2% like the elementary is as well. It's important that the data is reviewed as a whole and so a bird's eye view is very important as we've seen in the presentations both by Mr. Rother and, and Mr. Gilbert, Dr. Gilbert. But we have to view affirmative actions and firm actions that we take um, intentionally by looking at the localized data. So what might that look like? So for elementaries that are between 500 to 800 students, I'd like to bring us through a few scenarios. An elementary of 500 students and staff 
would require 10 active cases, confirmed cases, for that school to transition. An elementary of 800 students, which would be a, a, a school um, of our 31 elementary sites, um, would have 16 active cases. A junior high of 700 students would have 11 active cases at the 1.5%, and a junior high of 900 elementary students and staff would have 14 active cases. Our high schools um, would have a smaller high school of 2,500, um, would have 25 active cases between staff and students, and uh, a larger high school of 4,000 students and staff, um, 40 active cases. You may ask why the percentages are different between elementary and high school. Well, at elementary, we do have um, the ability with the lower numbers to have uh, additional mitigation strategies that the high schools may not be able to put in. And then also the sheer difference, and I think people can see the sheer difference of a percentage in numbers. Uh, elementary schools are quite lower than our junior high schools, lower enrolled, and then of course staff is, is a higher, um, a higher percentage of, of, uh, of, of allocated staff to at the high school level in the junior highs. So what's our temporary school closure timeline and process? Um, when a school hits the threshold of student staff active cases, and, and believe me, we look at this multiple times during the day. Um, Ms. Hartley uh, is on the phone and with Mr. Rother, Dr. Gilbert and myself, uh, it seems like we have one-to-one -one connections uh, throughout the day. So we want to make sure that our families are notified 48 hours in advance of any temporary school closure or school closures. Um, this provides proper time for parents to make adjustments for safe care of our children. We have to understand that we're still responsible for our children throughout this closure period, so we want to make sure that that transition is, is done successful for parents. Instructional model shifts to virtual learning. So when a school is closed and when they hit that threshold, we go to virtual learning. It's not a blended learning, it's a, it's a virtual learning. With our students, we've done that um, and we've modified at the beginning of this year uh, to become a little more successful and our teachers have put in so much time and effort into, into really working with that model. So we'd go back to what they know best and would move into the virtual. School sites would distribute the uh, computers for students who do not have access. So it may be that they need the device. It may, not, it may mean that they have to have connectivity. So we would ensure that that distribution, rather than before when we went down as a whole district, we did centralized distribution. This would be at the site to be able to expedite the computers to students who need them for that time period. Staff and teachers would report to the campus 24 hours after school closure is called. What happens during that first 24 hours is really important. We would go through uh, the school to disinfect and would have a district-wide fogging. Uh, Mr. Fletcher and his team actually are doing that now when we have cases. Uh, we'll go in and fog classrooms or hallways or wings or entire portions of campuses just as a, as a preventative measure. Uh, this would include that happening during the first 24 hours. So after the first 24 hours, everybody would be out of the school. The disinfecting of surfaces and the fogging would take place. These are mitigation strategies that the county would work with us on um, to be able to, to move forward with. But that's why that 24 hours, the next 24 hours, teachers would come back in so they have all the resources available to them to continue that virtual learning within the classroom environment. When a school hits the threshold of student staff active COVID-19 cases, the school will be closed for five days. Now that five day closure may accompany a weekend, which may, will require a seven day rest time for that school. If it hits the five days within a week, of course we'd have a nine day. But what we're sure of is that it would allow most positive cases that are triggered, um, the temporary closure to clear before returning back to the impacted site. So it would give us the required time for everybody to have, come back in with a fresh start and for, those, for that to dissipate through, through that area or that community. It allows for students with COVID-like symptoms to be evaluated during that time as well. And then it also allows the opportunity um, for students to be tested or staff for COVID-19 and obtain results. 
So that, that period of time does give us uh, time to be able to do that. Our, our recommendations don't come lightly, but we also look at um, the fact that our localized data shows different things for different schools within our district. And this plan will provide us an opportunity to act intentional, to ad ad adhere the right amount of fix or the measure of, of being able to uh, put some preventative and uh, measures in place um, by the site and, and enable for us to focus and concentrate on that site and then bring them back together to, to continue the in-person learning and monitor the numbers from there. So we present the plan to you uh, based on all the input and the data that, that we have and made available to you and are welcome to, for suggestions on the plan as you see it moving forward. Thank you, Mr. Narducci, I appreciate. Um, Dr. Gilbert, thank you. Mr. Rother, thank you. Um, lots of detail and um, data analysis has gone through this and collection of, of data. Um, personally, I am very, very happy to see that our mitigation strategies are actually being proven by our data that they are effective. Um, I, I'm, that really um, is a testimony to all of our staff um, who are and, and families who are, are complying and are um, taking this seriously. And I, I truly appreciate that not only staff, but also the community support um, in, in helping us to be able to keep um, our students uh, in the classroom with a live teacher. Um, are there any questions? Mrs. McGee. Ed, excuse me, thank you all for an excellent presentation. I have a couple of questions, and I'm gonna go backwards first. Um, if we close a school, we're giving the 48 hour notice to the parents that we're closing the school, and then cleaning and being closed for at least five days. Are we going to send notification to the parents of a date that we anticipate the school will be reopened? Uh, yes, correct. Um, we will make sure that when letters go out and, and uh, communication goes out, I'm sure it'll be also done through our school messaging system, that it would also have the return date that's anticipated. Um, we'll also be monitoring data during that time as well um, to see if there's any impacts to that, but we will definitely pro-communicate so people can make those choices and know how long that school is closed for. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I want to ask a few questions about students that are um, at home because they have COVID or they're at home because they're quarantined. So their school is still open, but you know certain students are quarantined at home. Um, what type of learning assistance do we have available for those students? So students that are quarantined, and we started this last Monday, um, <clears throat> students that are quarantined are able to join the classroom virtually on Google Meets. So teachers are, we've, we've identified students that are, are home and communicate that with the teacher and they would open up a Google Meets and teachers are responsible then for providing some virtual instruction. And it's more of a, uh, a view that a students can view into the classroom, see the live instruction happening, the direct instruction, either email a teacher, or excuse me, or um, chat a teacher in the chat room, or in some situations even ask a question virtually if they need to some clarification. But any of our students that are on quarantine as of last Monday, we started that as a virtual option for them to view live instruction. Okay, thank you. And that's for all grade levels? Correct. Okay. And then do we have a, um, a pool of tutors? So students that you know, are falling behind because they were quarantined or for whatever reason, do we have um, tutors available um, that a parent can ask for help from? 
So as of right now, uh, we're requesting that parents work through their classroom teacher if they need additional time. Um, we have had situations where students either couldn't get on or need some clarification that they couldn't ask during class where they can contact that teacher and every one of the, the teachers obviously are there after school and they can assist them at that point. Uh, we don't have a pool of standalone tutors that goes in and sort of helps tutor students on quarantine, but our teachers are available for support when they're not teaching. Okay, thank you. Um, and one last question. Um, surrounding school districts, Gilbert, um, Higley, Queen Creek, um, do we happen to know what status they're in as far as virtual, in-person, et cetera? So I, I, um, I can't speak to all the districts, uh, but Gilbert, uh, the largest district close to us, they're implementing a very similar uh, threshold for when their students will transition. I believe uh, they had a school transition to a hybrid model last week when they hit the 1% for their high schools. Their percentages are the same as ours, so 1% at the high school, 1.5 at the junior high, and then two at elementary. Um, the surrounding districts are, uh, to my understanding, mostly in person to some extent. Uh, Queen Creek, Higley are both in person. Uh, Gilbert is in person with this threshold, and so districts are similar to us. And again, our threshold levels are the same as Gilbert's. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Evans, do you have any questions? Thank you, Madam President. Um, I probably would like to come back with some more, some follow-up questions. Um, thank you for a good presentation. I think I was not, this isn't what I was expecting, anticipating. Um, and and it, for, for all three of you and everybody in this room and everybody on every campus, this is hard. This is really, really hard. And, and Mr. Rother, you, you brought up a really good point. This is data, but we're talking about students and kids who are the same people and families, right? And, um, and the one thing that I think we're not talking about enough here is the impact that all of this has on our educators and staff in the schools, right? But let, let me start with something I've said before and something I'll say for the next three weeks because that's as long as I'll be here. Um, you're talking about how we go through transitions. And what we know is that we've seen changes from the CDC, we've seen changes from the federal government, we've seen changes from from Maricopa County Health Department, right? We and and we have, but what's the thing that we have to do? We have to educate kids, and we have to keep our staff feeling good about the way they're educating kids. And it's hard because they've had to make a lot of changes too. So one of the things, a couple of things that I'll say is we have to be and have to find a way to be as consistent as possible for the education of our students, right? So 1,870, where's the number? 1,876 students have gone in and out of quarantine. And we have Thanksgiving holiday coming up. I do have a question coming up, but we know that if spread is happening from the outside into the district, we're probably gonna continue to see more of that. If not over this holiday, over the next one, and ongoing. So again, that transition thing, we have to look at how do we maintain the quality of instruction for our kids, right? And I think we can do a better job of that. And, and teachers right now are starting to really fall into creating more rigor. Um, but how do we look at those 1,800 kids, almost 1,900 kids, and make it so that they're, it, it's almost seamless. How do we do that? How do we make it so it's seamless right now for kids who are in person? Because when it really comes down to it, as parents, we have to make choices for the health and well being of our own families. And we may decide that our student right now should not be in a building, especially at the high school level, should not necessarily be in a building. How do we keep their, the rigor of their education and the continuity of their education in place if we choose to have them not be brick and mortar right at that point? Yeah, so um, Mr. Evans, the, um, like I stated before, the, the Google Meets 
hopefully will provide a level of that. Is it the same as being in the classroom? Absolutely not. And can a teacher, is it an easy job for a teacher to do both virtual and in person? No, um, but our teachers have been doing it. Um, they started last week. And so as we continue to do it with students that are on quarantined, I'm hopeful that that process will get easier and students will get more and more out of those lessons if they're quarantined. Um, I wanna answer your question another way too and reiterate something I stated before is that we really need parent support because what we're seeing is we know they're spread in the community and I think that even though we're not finding students contracting COVID in our schools, we know what's happening in the community and we need parents' help. Uh, we really need parents' help to monitor their students and if their students are sick, the students don't feel well, keep them home, uh, monitor them, and don't send them to school sick because every time that happens and a student that's positive is around other students, it does force us to quarantine students and um, to send them home for two weeks. Right. And so uh, we're doing the, the best job we can to ensure that they can still view their classroom in live instruction if, if that happens, but that doesn't happen if, um, if parents can, can help us in keeping their kids home and monitoring their symptoms. Okay, I'm gonna go back to one of the points you just made from what I made that you made earlier. Um, and that's that teachers didn't just start doing this last week. They started doing this back when yeah. school started because everybody was virtual, right? Mm -hmm. So what is preventing us from keeping that flexibility for any student who just, who just you know, does, I, kids don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. Not just the parents, kids don't feel safe. So what is it to, have a student just say, you know what, I'm self-quarantining, not because I need to, but because I don't feel safe being around other people right now because of maybe the habits that they're doing. So I'm going to go, I'm going to leave. How do I access that virtual, you know, how, how do I access Google, Google Meet so that I can participate from, from home? Yeah. So it's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think that uh, some of our students who decided to do the complete virtual option are at COA. And so there is an option there for students to be 100% virtual. Um, right now, in terms of the live um, viewing of the classroom, we did, you know, we did do that for quarantine students as a way to begin to implement that. Um, as of right now, that's who that option is for. But you bring up a, a good question. Is, is that something that we can expand and offer to more students? Um, Currently, we're, we're reserving that for our quarantine students, and so that's a small group of students that may be on, and some teachers may not have any students um, on quarantine. For most of our teachers, that's the case. Uh, but it is something, certainly, that, that we could take a look at in the future. Okay, because really, if I just go home, you, don't, you have, people are not really coming through to us. Um, Lindsay, you can maybe jump in on this. Uh, there are plenty of people who are not going to say the reason they're not at school right now for the next six days. But, and we may think we know what that is, but you know, without true evidence and documentation, we don't know. So all of a sudden, you know, how am I getting educated because of the fact that I chose not to be in school? Because I got a car accident and broke my leg. I mean, there could be many, many reasons, right? People are not forthcoming all the time. Sure. Do you have yeah, yeah. Um, just, Mr. Evans, just a couple of things that I just wanted to share with the board a little bit is um, quarantine is a mitigation strategy. And just in the fact that it's there and that our numbers are relevant and that we do have a higher quarantining rate means that the mitigation strategy is working out that they're tracing. I'd be really, I'd be a, a little cautious to think if we had low quarantining that we were actually tracing as well as, as they are. And um, that's what's, what's creating that piece. Um, we are looking at um, active, te active teaching. It's hard to do. It is really hard to do uh, when you have students online as well as in your classroom. But our teachers are really stepping up and, 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 and working through it. Um, our plan helps to maybe alleviate a little of that when those numbers get to be a little, a, a little higher. And so, um, and again, the, the, the work at the high schools, when you have some students being quarantined, is a little, a little more difficult because it does go to all of, the, all of the classrooms, most of the teachers. Where in an elementary, you have one teacher who at most times, especially in the primary classrooms, are wanting that student to be connected so they come back with less gaps. But, I, but the one point I wanted to provide too is that having that number is a good thing because that's a great mitigation strategy, along with our other mitigation strategies. 
However, cohorting of schools is one of probably the best cohorts that are available. And you'll see in other nations, um, they're utilizing that group as a cohort that is the last to go before everything else, restaurants, other pieces, because of the fact that kids come to a routine schedule five days a week. And even if they're in athletics or things after school, they still have that continual schedule. So it's easier to keep that group cohorted when, when we don't have that, we don't know where they are, and that's where you get more community spread, um, when your cohort groups are just not able to be established and continuous. And so I just wanted to bring that point up as well, that the schools become a very good cohort group. But when we hit those percentages in our plan, we know there's something else we have to do. Ms. Love, are you still with us? Yes, I am. Did you have some Is questions? Is it my turn to go? Yes. Yes, I do. I just want to thank you for the presentation. Um, and I just kind of want to share the, the sheer irony of me being at home sick awaiting my own COVID test during this presentation. Um, and, you know, if I can go back to slides, I think it was 10, where we broke down the age group. We did a lot of focusing in this presentation on zero to 19 and how that was lower, right? But I'm in that 20 to 44 year old age group, right? That's 49%. And I'm wondering if there was any consideration as to what the average age of our staff is. And I know that you broke it down cumulatively in terms of like our staff and the positivity rate for them. But as Mr. Evans said, we just finished with Halloween, which we saw a bit of a spike because of parties, right? We've got Thanksgiving and we've got Christmas to go. And we have families who may not be working with us to let us know when, you know, their student or their child is sick. Um, they're not taking them for testing. They're keeping them home for maybe one or two days and sending them back into the classroom, which puts our teachers and staff at risk. Um, and I am concerned about our children and their positivity rate. But I think that one of the things that we're missing is how this is going to impact the positivity rate of our staff. When we have two holidays coming up, we have a lack of testing and a lack of transparency within our community. Ms. Love, I, I thank you for sharing that information. I will assure you our staff is one of our focuses. One of the things that Mr. Evans, you brought up, and that was we hadn't had any conversation about our staff. And Mr. Rother and, and Mr. Narducci shared, you know, what does that look like for students if they're at home quarantined and why not make that shift? Because it is a difficult, it is a difficult task. Since we started these, these meetings and started with COVID, that has been something that's come up every time is how are we going to make sure that, because we can say we have really strong when students are in class and that in-person learning from the teacher being in the classroom is, is what we're looking for. But then we have students at home and we know that there's different reasons why students are at home, whether we're sending them home because of quarantine or something's happened in their family and they have to quarantine themselves and then figuring out how can we do something for those students, which why was the reason why we went to at least having the student be able to see and hear what's going on in the classroom because we were already using Google Classroom for them to get work and things of that nature. So those are some of the things that we looked at, but the difficulty of now saying that the teaching in the classroom is going to be as good as it should be while the teachers are trying to make sure they're moving through what's happening with the student at home and answering questions and keeping them engaged and at the same time keeping the students engaged. I'm not saying it isn't possible. We'd have to figure out what does that look like because there are others that are doing that and, and I can only speak anecdotally from having conversations they're not all that excited about doing it. And there's a lot of people saying they're overwhelmed in how they're doing that. So I'm not saying it can't be done, but it has to be a discussion on what would that look like. And then our families that have students on campus and our families that have students at home understanding it's not going to look like when you were normally in the classroom with the teacher because of the load that's gonna be put on the teacher. As it relates to Mrs. Love's um, a question in her statement in regards to our teachers. The goal of that has been put out by Mr. Rother and his team is how does the classroom look? 
when we're trying to mitigate things that are happening on campus. And that is, even though we have, we have great teachers in Chandler that still want to move through the classroom, which is great, but the goal is let's keep distance, not just from students, but from teachers from students. And so now having to teach from the front of the room, which will assist some of those students that are having to watch the lesson from home, that we can keep distance from our teachers and our students so that we can do the best we can to keep them distance from what's going on and making sure that when we have students that are positive, we're moving them and the quarantine students out so that we can try and mitigate it as much as possible. We're, we're at a, a, a difficult situation because we're here and teachers are teaching because they love kids. They love teaching. They love making sure that students can learn. At the same time, we have 45,000 students within our district and many of them want to be in the classroom. And so now we have to figure out how can we approach that so that one, we can keep our students and staff safe and still do what we're supposed to be doing at this time, and that is teaching students. So it's, it's, a, it's a balance that we're trying to, to work through that is difficult at best. Well, I think so. I think I missed where the average age of our, our teaching and staff, teachers and staff were. But I will say from my experience, I wear two masks, I social distance, um, I stay away from large group gatherings. I am at work two days a week, but I spend primarily, you know, my time in my office, distance from my staff. And even with the mitigation strategies that I have taken, I'm still at home with a virus that has not been determined, and it could be COVID. And so I think that that is something that we need to take into account that Mitigation strategies, sure, you know, I, I'm all for it. But if we're not looking at our teachers and their health and well-being, we're going to have teachers who are going to walk. And I've heard it from several teachers that they're scared. They, you know, don't know what the next few months are going to look like. And they feel like they are not being respected, not only by us, but the community at large and their fears are not being taken seriously. And I think that that is something that I would like to see addressed moving forward. Like, I'm wondering, you know, did we sit down with teachers and discuss this plan with them? No, we did not have a... How felt about the, the percent positivity rate that we've chosen or the fact that we've chosen to only close for five days, which for me, I heard that and I'm like, why not 10 to 14? Like, you know, did we do any consultation with the educators who have the heaviest lift and the staff who have the heaviest lift? We shared this information with the association. As for the number, uh, the age of teachers, I can make sure um, uh, Dr. Nance will be able to get you that information. And we will look at this as we move forward and get more information to make sure we're addressing the needs of our teachers. And, and the, the other thing that I'm hearing um, from teachers and parents alike is, you know, going back to uh, Mr. Evans' point is, can we trust the dashboard when we have parents who are openly online telling us that they are not going to be transparent with us? or, you know, keeping their kids out for a day and then sending them back into the classroom. Like, is the dashboard accurate when we have those kinds of questions looming? Well, the thing I would and, say... And it, 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 it's not just, you know, fear-based, and it's not just, you know, story or, you know, we've been presented with screenshots from legit parents in our district. Well, the, the thing I would say about our dashboard is what we are putting on the dashboard is the information we are collecting. So we know that there could be anyone that is deciding to come in, come in sick, send their students to school. We are doing our best to mitigate and control what we can as to what's happening on our schools and our campus. And it's unfortunate that you have that situation. I will say prior to COVID, there are students that were medicated and sent to school. And we have to hope that we can keep getting uh, the information out to our families as to the need to keep kids home if they're sick and, and for us to do the best we can in collecting the data that we see. It is unfortunate, but as for the dashboard, it, it's the data that we are collecting because we're sending students home. 
Some may not, may not be getting a test and we wouldn't know that, just like we wouldn't know if someone is asymptomatic and they're coming on campus, but when we find information out, we are utilizing that to make sure students are going home, those that are quarantined, as tough as it is with the numbers that we're sending home, um, we're trying to do. And please understand that I'm not saying that you guys aren't doing the best that you can because I understand that you're doing the best that you can with the information that is provided. Um, but I think, you know, that just goes to the point that we can have all the data in front of us and we're still operating blind. It's that what, what Dr. Castile says in terms of like flying the plane is you're building it thing. Um, and it's a question that our community members have and they're not feeling very safe with these stories and these screenshots floating out there. So I think that's something that we need to take into consideration, especially when we do data heavy presentations, what is the data telling us versus what is the data not telling us? Does that make sense? No, definitely. And, and I would agree yeah. with you. Yeah. The, the other question that I have, because I've been getting it a lot, and I, I think that you alluded to it, but I apologize because I'm over the phone, so it goes in and out. Um, so if a child in a household is sick, right, and maybe they test positive, but they have a sibling who goes to a different school who is not positive, not displaying any symptoms, is the expectation that that well child stays home and quarantines with their family? Yes. Um, or can they, okay, perfect, perfect. That's a question I've been getting a lot and I thought that it was the answer that you said, um, but I just wanted to get that spoken aloud. Yes, and, um, and they would be able to, um, because they would be on quarantine, they'd have access to Google Classroom. Okay. We also talked a lot about online being more difficult for K through three, and I hear that, right? Um, but what is the data for online education for our older grades, like our four through 12? Um, particularly since our secondary, they're getting ready to go off, of, off to college, right? And we know that our colleges right now are online, right? Um, and even before COVID, we've had colleges and grad schools who have operated with a hybrid model of being online, um, in classrooms, or full online. Um, so do we have any data on how the effectiveness of online education for our older grades? I don't, I don't have any data to share, but I know that the online is difficult um, for, for many students. It's not for everyone, and we understand that. Um, when we were looking at what we can do within our district, um, our online was one of our programs that, that we had to offer. We've had to also put some things in place with office hours, as well as teachers um, having um, open, open labs for kids to be able to get help not perfect situation and we're continuing to improve that um, so that we can help our students we've added new some more counselors to our online as well as more success coaches which aren't counselors they're really focusing on students that may not be logging on may not be connecting and helping them and find out what the problems are so that they can get them connected to the resources but th that is still for us we're, we're building that right now um, and getting that moving forward to help our students yeah, thank, I appreciate that. I think, too, because we tend to knock online education, right? And I guess that online education is not for everybody. I, I certainly understand that. Um, however, online education, there are possibilities and opportunities. Um, you know, when I was in grad school, they talked about online education as the next wave and the next frontier in getting education to people who maybe have the least amount of access. And I'm wondering if maybe we can also change that dialogue and maybe because we are a district that is innovative, start thinking and conceptualizing what online education can look like and, you know, how we can use this to our advantage because we don't know what the next few months are going to hold. And, and I would like us to, to see us build something stronger. Um, for instance, too, um, you know, I'm getting a lot of, emails and phone calls from sped parents who you know maybe have like medically fragile children and or, or something to that effect or don't want their kids in the classroom at being exposed 
but we have no SPED opportunities for COA. So, you know, I'm wondering if maybe somebody could sit down with our SPED parents or some of the groups that, you know, I think it's, uh, what is the one that uh, we just went to the presentation um, for, is it CPAC, one of them, um, and just kind of like flesh that out a bit because we do have a number of SPED parents who feel like they've been left out of the dialogue. Yeah, Mrs. Love, this is uh, Larry. Just to address a couple of things there. Um, so re in regards to virtual learning, we are, we are having discussions about what virtual learning uh, can look like. Uh, we have a Future Ready Schools process that is in place already to take a comprehensive look at technology and what we want that virtual, what we want both the in-person experience through using technology and the virtual experience <laughs> using technology to look like in Chandler in the future. I could tell you we just met, and that's a, that's a collaboration between business partnerships, um, folks from the city, our teachers, our site administrators. We even have a student that serves on that team to look at um, how we can best utilize technology and, and in the virtual setting as well. And a lot of our conversation focused around um, what that will look like post-COVID. So we are currently doing that for sure. Um, in, in regards to the special education parents, we meet quarterly with the CPAC, which is um, our Special Education Parent Advisory Committee. And um, they meet with us to share with us their concerns and we brainstorm um, ways to break down barriers for our uh, students with special needs to access curriculum, to, to learn at the level uh, that we expect them to. And so we are, con we are currently meeting with the CPAC and we'll continue to do that. Perfect. Um, and I I have more questions, but I want to just be respectful of everybody else's time. So um, I will turn it back over to um, Barb. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Love. Um, Mrs. Bruner, do you have some questions? Um, I did have a question. So if teachers are exposed to a student in the classroom or another staff member, or any staff member, not just teachers, um, what is the procedure and are we actually following that with each case? Yes, yeah, so if a teacher uh, has a close contact with a student or another staff member, they are notified of that. Um, Mrs. Hartley could speak even more specifically if there are specific situations or what that process looks like. But we are uh, following through with our protocols the same way we would uh, if a student comes into contact with another student that's positive. So if a student or staff member is in contact with someone who's positive, they are quarantined for 14 days? No, so our staff is essential workers, so they wouldn't be, uh, they wouldn't be quarantined for those 14 days, um, but they are notified that they've come into close contact with a student or a staff member that's tested positive. So when you say essential workers, I know there are multiple school districts who quarantine teachers for 14 days. Are you just saying that that's an optional thing the district has tended to use to justify not having them quarantined? Well, I'll, I mean, I would not defer required, to Wendy. I guess on, is what I'm saying. Yeah, like, yeah, not I mean, like, I would oh, defer you're an essential worker, you have to report. There's no law like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have not quarantined our teachers. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll defer to Wendy on the HR perspective of that. Mm -hmm. But uh, as of right now, we do make sure that our teachers are aware if they've come into close contact with another staff member or a student that tests positive. Um, but in terms of mandating that we quarantine, I'll, I can refer to Dr. Nance on that one. Um, we've tried to avoid sending them home altogether, but we've made some accommodations for them. So, for instance, we've had a teacher working out of an empty classroom at a site and, and working with some of her virtual students or small groups where we can have more plexiglass up. Um, we've worked with um, Lindsay Hartley on the appropriate PPE those staff members are wearing and checking symptoms um, and making sure they're staying socially distanced while they're still at work if they've had an, a possible exposure. Um, and that's not limited to teachers. We do it with our support staff as well. So as you might imagine, that concerns me that we're not quarantining staff members who otherwise would be quarantined. If they were any other person on campus, they would be, you know, any student on campus, they'd be quarantined. Um, and that, this, that other districts are following that. Um, and then my other qu question, I guess, is about like when you were thinking of this plan, it kind of feels to me like it's um, what we expected the county or state to create for our schools when to judge when there's going to be an outbreak. Um, so, you know, there was an expectation that the county was going to create, they never did, of course, but um, that they were going to create 
cut and dry criteria, like if you hit a certain percentage point, that's an outbreak, and, and they haven't done that. So this kind of feels like what some people at least expected the county or the state to do to create, like, all right, this has gotten out of hand, there's an outbreak, we need to shut this school down, right? So that is that what you were thinking when you- That's correct. Also, this? none of this gets done in isolation. We have to work directly with the county. They will know our plan, they will know our percentages, and they'll still be working with us when we hit those, those thresholds. Um, they may come up with other pieces with support teams that they have in place, um, but we really felt that we had to take the lead based on knowing what's happening at our schools best. Um, if Ms. Love wants to go again or if someone else has some more questions. Those were just my couple questions. I, I actually have a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. So we, we talk about um, um, the virtual learning and uh, we are offering that to quarantine students. but. This vir the virtual learning that we are providing to them is not the same as what we were doing at the beginning of the of the school year. Could you explain the differences um, between the two, and then um, explain when we close a school what the difference is between what we were seeing in at the end of August or during the month of August? and what we would be seeing at a um, school that has been temporarily closed. Yes, so the main difference between the virtual learning that would be taking place right now for students on quarantine, and, and this is an obvious one, but the biggest difference is, is that teacher has to teach both in-person students that are there in front of them and also find a way to allow the students virtually to view the live instruction. The interaction that can take place is certainly limited if a student's online as opposed to in person. And that teacher, as Dr. Gilbert talked about, they have to be somewhat stationary. They may need to make sure that they're in front of the computer while they're doing their direct instruction. Um, that is very much limited to um, you know, just viewing the instruction and having some limited interaction. What the virtual instruction looked like prior to the in person was that teachers would essentially plan their two hour, at the high school level, their two hour lesson, at the elementary level, <clears throat> their daily lesson, and provide um, a, a certain amount of time and instruction virtually, where there was some dialogue over Google Meets, all the students were there and interacted virtually online, and then uh, additional resources were provided for students to work for the rest of the period, and teachers decided how best to check in, but there were some minimum expectations regarding how many minutes they worked with students virtually, how many times they interacted. The current model of virtual with uh, Google Meets and students that are on quarantine, that's much more teacher directed because teachers know their lessons best. They know when and how a student can best interact online because they do have to balance the in-person with the students that are quarantined. When we go into, or if we go into a situation where we're needing to temporarily close that school, um, the, the plan is, is to ensure that students can get on virtually. So that's why we need a little bit of time before students, um, we actually shut the school down, is to be able to provide students with technology who needs them so they can log on and be interactive in the virtual setting for that five-day school closure. Um, our intention is if we do have to, to do that on a temporary basis for those five days that the schools are closed, that that would look a lot similar to the way it looked in the first quarter, where teachers are going through their normal schedule, interacting with students virtually, and sort of transitioning back to where we were during the first quarter, knowing that that was gonna be for a very limited uh, time frame of five days. Sorry, and then- Ms. Moss, can I give yes. you a, a brief example, just real quickly? Dr. Nance and I were talking earlier today about a scenario. And it's almost a different way of looking at how we're educating right now. It's totally different. If teachers are saying they're tired across the state, it's because they've never done this before. So for example, today, um, uh, we were talking about a story of a, of a student who was going to specialized services. So she was in her regular classroom going to specialized services. Let's say it's speech. Let's say it's Susie that was going to speech. Well, the speech teacher in a specialized uh, location was saying, well, I guess Johnny's not here, so we're just gonna have to go on. And Susie goes, well, no, Johnny is here. And she takes a laptop in her hand and just turns it around. There's, Johnny's on the computer. But for that teacher, she had to realize too that 
Some kids are going to be learning at home, and they're going to still be exposed and connected to the same instruction. But it was kind of a weird thing that John, Johnny was there. He just, was on, he just wasn't there. So this is a lot for teachers to really get a hold of. And, and yet, this school was doing a great job. This, path, this speech uh, teacher was doing a wonderful job of connecting the kids to specialized services. And that's an example of how they are connected to SPED through a virtual environment. But we have to almost rethink how we thought. And I know that sounds weird, but we have to almost retrain and rethink how we're thinking where kids are and how they're connected to learning. So it, it, it's, a, it's a big jump. I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> I can see where that level of newness comes in. And it, it's almost something that I think we're going to be faced with for a while. So. Mm -hmm. um, when a school is closed, what are the attendance expectations for the students? Sure. So one of them, one of the expectations is right now for schools to look at who who has been disengaged, because uh, we have those students in schools possibly. Where do you know stu students that are at COA? And to make sure that we can get those kids engaged right away. So for a student to be engaged, we need them to have access uh, to virtual uh, to virtual instruction, and we need to have them connected. Um, some schools have still done a great job of providing instruction for students that are out for a couple of days. Just like they're sick, they, they provide them a packet saying, or here's your assignments before you get we're sick. Those are basically for our students in elementary that were gone for one or two days. Um, but for them to be successful, our teachers need to move and adjust to the virtual, go right back to Google Classroom teaching, be ready for that. Uh, if their school is, we're going to be seeing the data, we're going to be looking at it. It's not going to be a surprise if we all of a sudden get there. So we'll do as much preloading as we can to get a staff ready uh, and informed, keeping communication open with that school leader as well as the teachers that there may be in this next week or uh, if cases come up that they're ready to go within 48 hours. So the preparedness is going to be important for the district, uh, computer devices, as well as making sure that we hit that site and triage that site or sites when it's needed to go. We want to keep keep kids connected. I think Katie Mo is here. She's our COA Elementary Connect leader. Um, and she can tell you too, it's, it's hard in virtual to keep kids engaged. Probably one of the biggest things is uh, when kids are, are disengaged during learning. So we're really going to have to work with our parents again or those caretakers, because it's not going to always be a parent, um, how to engage kids, how to keep that grit and uh, that staying power so that they can get through those lessons and that our teachers can teach. During a closure, though, everybody will be virtual. So that's going to be a little different. So everybody will be engaged in the virtual learning. Our kids know how to do it. Just like, I think, if we set the challenge forth, they, they, they rise to the occasion. A lot of people thought our little kids couldn't wear masks when they came back to school on September 14th. Every single one did a great job. I think as adults, sometimes we put limitations on people that don't exist. So we just got to make sure that our kids are connected. Our administrators and other personnel are connecting kids, making those phone calls when we don't think they're connected, and then be able to assist. And again, if we're triaging one or two schools, or maybe it's a large high school, we can direct more resources towards doing that, and that engagement will be higher. And we just need kids to be engaged. I think that's the number one thing. Have access and be engaged. Mrs. I Moss, guess, uh, was your question on atten taking attendance? Well, it, it was more along the lines of, I, I want to make sure that, that um, the schools and the district make it clear to parents and to students that when a school closes, it's not a vacation. You are still expected to oh, transition yeah. to yeah, virtual. We would, yes. and we would still take be attendance. Taking all your classes yeah. and all that, because this, that is what it's for, um, right. to, to put kind of a reset into the school um, to let work through well, the positivity issues and the cases through that school and hopefully come back. Loud and clear, absolutely correct. And you got to remember, a lot of times they're going to be in the middle of assignments. It may not be at the start of an instructional unit. So a lot of that's going to be continuation of learning. So you know, for them to get credit for that period of work that's being done and being able to still collect grades, um, and that shorter period of time does help us not lose assessment pieces for kids because progress monitoring is really hard to do virtually. So um, that duration of time also helps us to, 
to keep track of how kids are progressing as well. And I think the system is still uh, as usual, right? Where if it's virtual and they don't show up, they're gonna get a call home. Your kid was not Correct. in attendance that day and they'll, they'll find out within 12 hours that Correct. that's an issue. Yeah. And at elementary, we take uh, the attendance in the morning and then in the afternoon as well. And then I guess my last question is, um, I, uh, when I go ahead and sort um, the list of our, all of our schools by s the number of staff and students within that school, typically our high schools, of course, bubble to the top with the highest number of students and um, we're looking at those with 1%. But then as we move down through the junior highs, um, and, and if we look at um, ACP Erie, it has, which is a high school, um, we're looking at a school that is comparable to, say, Oxier Elementary. Yes. Yet the number of students um, there um, at the high school level, um, we're looking at a 2 per, or a 1 percent versus an elementary school that is with about the same number of students at a 2 percent. Um, granted, I know that the elementaries do um, a bit more cohorting with the classroom and your sixth graders don't intermingle with your um, kindergartners typically. But I guess as we, when I start looking at some of the, the junior highs, um, some of them are pretty close to the, some of the elementary school sizes too. And, and so um, I guess do we need to make some special considerations based on the size of the school or is it because of the behavior of the um the, the students mixing mixing into classes well, like well, we see yeah. in junior highs that's exactly it um you know we, we can we can adjust with any suggestions you give us we i want I, that's what we're here for but it is exactly due to that because elementary cohorts are pretty solid they're they're, they're, they're after school, they're not going many places. They're not sports going on. We don't have, we have virtual running club happening right now, which is, uh, which is a great move. But the junior highs have more activity and so do the high schools and they're busy places. And, um, and that's the exact reason why there's chances that other cohorting groups are going to be taking place during there is why the percentage is there for them. But we can always look at a smaller school based on its, its, uh, yeah. its impact like an ACP, which is definitely has less students than say a Hamilton or a, or than some of our bigger junior highs. And look more from a junior high perspective of the numbers than mm -hmm. high school perspective. And I, and I guess though, I, I do have, I guess the only um, concern when you start talking about um, the extracurricular activities and things is that um, is our elite performance academy. And the fact that many of those students, or virtually all of those students are attending some type of a gym or other facility that we hope is being cohorted um, at this at that time but um, so I don't know if we need to continue to just monitor some of the data for that particular school but I think we have some Correct. We, um, some areas that we might want to yeah. continue to look at um, because of the issues of the the mixing great suggestion we will and um, and and also um, our gyms also, they want to stay open. And so they're, they're doing some really good, co good cohorting strategies because they know their athletes that are coming to them are like family, you know, as well as it's their business. Um, so we could check into that a little bit more and I'll talk to Mr. Hickey as well. I was reaching out to those uh, gym studios and some of them are one-on-one -on -one versus the larger group, but we can do that, yes. Okay. Um, Mr. Evans, oh, um, Mrs. McGee. I just have one quick question. Um, at the end of this second quarter, will um, parents be able to move their students in or out of the Chandler Online Academy? So we are currently uh, in the process of sending home a, a form for our Chandler Online Academy students to fill out if they'd like to return to in-person. Um, and so we are going to ask them uh, specifically if they want to return or if they're happy to stay in Chandler Online Academy. For students that want to opt into Chandler Online Academy at the semester, they would go through the normal enrollment process and open enrollment process to do that. Yep. Mr. Evans. Thank you. Okay, so again, not the presentation I was expecting, but I guess what I've heard and I'm very convinced of is 
Chandler schools are the safest place for our kids to be right now, um, based on the, the situation, the, the circumstances we're in. Um, but I'm feeling a little bit of a disconnect because I talk to a lot of teachers and administrators who just are just overwhelmed. And, but you know what? They're great educators. They're great teachers. I'm smiling because I know the quality of the people. And I've, back when we were completely virtual, I sat in on classes and I saw how the, the teacher would create groups with Google Meets or Teams or whatever and have the students do work together so, so that they were getting through uh, pieces of the lesson and then they'd all come back together and they'd have to present. It was fabulous, right? Yeah, it wasn't face to face, but for what it was, for what we had to do right then, it was great. Fortunately, I didn't get called on. But, um, but I, I guess I'm feeling a little bit of a disconnect because whenever we go out, we talk, we, people, are, people are like, how do you guys do it? 24 to one, you know, students to teacher, how do you do that? And people are, as great as our teachers are, a lot of them are overwhelmed right now and I'm feeling like the numbers aren't adding up correctly it's because I hear about teachers who are teaching this section, this section, this section, because they're short, we're shorthanded and they have maybe, you know, more than 24 kids in a class, but then they have other classes over here where they have more than 24 kids in a class. So I'm not asking for you to answer it now, but I think it's important we understand where, and Lana's gonna be mad at me, but where we need to beef up the resources. Do we, do we need more staff in, such, in, in this circumstance, even though we don't have money for them? What do we need to do to take some of the pressure off these teachers and create the quality and back to the continuity consistency? What do we have to do? Because it seems like something's missing. Well, I'll first take a shot at, at, at some of what you, you've shared. And I think any, I think the majority of the teachers you're gonna to talk to are overwhelmed, administrators alike, just because the sheer situation we're in, let alone whether, whatever you're teaching. Um, at the secondary I can speak for, we still have teachers teaching maybe one or two preps depending on what subjects they're covering. We've known since the beginning that it, dis, um, distancing at the secondary was gonna be difficult depending on you know, students at the online. Um, I think our HR has done a phenomenal job with, we've had to move teachers from in-person to online, from online to in-person, see who might wanna split between in-person and online and add a bunch of staff that we didn't plan on hiring this year. We've done that since the beginning of the year. So we're constantly, I'm constantly talking with principals, where are we at, what's going on, how can we help, what resources can we put in? But we also know that you know it, it, this is a time it's also difficult that there may or may not be teachers out there, but we are looking at what the need is and trying to a, a address those. Is it perfect? It's not. Is it overwhelming? Yes, it is. And so we've been constantly trying to make sure that we're having conversations to do what we can for our teachers and, and let them know. We might be missing the mark on some of those. This is new for all of us. And the goal is how can we keep everybody safe? Everybody's not going to agree, um, but we, we are putting forth how can we do that. Mr. Evans, I just want to share a little bit now. I'll ask if Ms. Roth can hand those to you. Um, just in transparency, I want, I want to give you an update of elementary numbers right now, just because your question kind of asked about it. So in kindergarten, we have 105 sections right now. 70% of those sections are at 18 or less. This is as of October 26th. 96% um, of the sections have 22 students or less in them. And what, I, what, we, what we cohorted this with is if, if things are moved totally out, we can, we can get as much social distancing there. And you can see 5% have a hard time with the social distancing to the maximum. But we still have that tire inflated, like I told you before, there's some, there's some cohorting going on there with that. So our first grade at 110 sections, 55% are less than 18 per classroom. For, uh, with an additional 43% in 1922, bringing it to 98% of our classrooms under, under the 22 to one. Um, in our second grade, a little harder there because we have 85% that are under 22%, uh, percent, but 56% are less than 18. And when I mean less than 18, that was a cap. A lot of those classrooms are 16 and below. In third grade, we have 170, 116 classrooms, 
and 90% of those classrooms have 22 uh, or lower, uh, with 48%, almost 50% being 18 or less. Um, with our fourth grade, 89% are at 22 or less, uh, with 39% being um, a little lower, uh, lower than 18. We do so in 11% of that, those classrooms have higher than 23%. So that, that 13 classrooms out of the 116 um, are doing different strategies, mitigations. Maybe there's plexiglass that's going in, or that they're, they're social distance four feet or five feet, but maybe not the six feet. But everything else is mitigated. Same cohorts, same masks, all of that. Fifth grade, 92% is below 22 to one, with 29% being less than 18. And in sixth grade, 42% of the classrooms have less than 18. 42% of 125 classrooms have less than 18 students. Um, 22 students or less, 40% for a total of 82%. Yes, that 18% that's a little higher, which equates to 23 classrooms, has to alter some mitigation strategies there. But again, the biggest thing that we're seeing there, we have another 117 sections of specialized instruction, self-contained. Those are still 100% below 11 students, mostly at three to four um, across those 117 sections. So the biggest thing that we're seeing with the frustration Teachers got in this protect this this whole thing to be able to be close to students. And in the elementary schools, you have students around you. You're, you're doing small group. You're doing guided instruction. You're over students. You're you're with them in different parts of classrooms. That's been really hard to develop other strategies for teachers to be able to implement the same pieces. So, I think in the future here. They are learning how to do small group instruction by individualizing it and putting them in separate parts of the room by having a classroom chart. But it's, that's been a big struggle for our teachers because they're not doing things the way they used to. Um, and we're not moving student cohorts. We're not moving it. We're moving teachers to different rooms. If, say, a sixth grade uh, departmentalized, the teacher's actually moving right now until we start to see the numbers go the opposite way. So we really are looking at mitigation strategies. In some regards, they'd like to lessen those. But we're not going to lessen them until our numbers start to come down in the right direction. I just gave the chart to you because I know I wanted to update you since the last time we covered this, uh, which was before September 14th. So, Mr. Narducci, I, I wanted to make a comment on this. So, really, what we're not, uh, what, what is so incredibly stressful for our staff is number one, not only can they go not go back to normal in their classroom for normal teaching when they go back to in person. They have to adopt whole new strategies and they're, they're having whole new classroom management skills that they need to develop that deal with masks and hand washing and um, the way they do lines. And, and so everything really has upended their world. Yes for our teachers. Yes, and still, we still have to get the intervention pieces put in. We still have to do our progress monitoring. And so they're, they're doing it, but it's, if they tell you they're tired, they are. A lot of people are tired. You ask our nurses and our doctors, they're tired too. I think our communities are tired. Uh, you know, so I, I wouldn't take that as, as an, uh, I think our teachers are tired. They're working darn hard and they're finding strategies and they're getting it done. And I have to, I think we all have to applaud them. We, we talk about that all the time. Um, I don't know if everybody's gonna feel appreciated, uh, but they're doing a good job and they're doing the best they can. And on top of that, Mrs. Mawson, as you well know, they're worried about catching COVID or their family members. I mean, Absolutely. there's a whole nother layer. So the stress level is real. And I would say it's uh, for every educator across the state and across the nation. The, the stress is real. And um, also going back to um, just the overall um, that schools are, are really a safer place for, for the students. Um, I've been looking at various studies over the last month or so that have been coming out all over the United States where they've been looking in various, um, in, in various states as to the transmission rates in the schools. And they're finding that they are, they are not, it is not spreading in the schools um, like it is spreading in the community. And I, I truly believe that, that you know, if, 
hate, hate to get on a philosophical thing here, but if everybody was doing what the schools are doing, we wouldn't be seeing as much transmission in the community as, um, as we do. And um, so I think that overall, in many places throughout the country, um, they, they've kind of come to the conclusion that the schools are not the problem with spreading that they thought they might have might be. A lot of people were worried about it, but the conclusions have come in that, that have said it's not the schools that are, are the problem. They've, they are documenting that, that it, is not, um, it does not have those significant spreading events uh, like you see at um, parties and, and gatherings and weddings and, and all of these other things where people are not uh, social distancing and not wearing masks. Um, so uh, I applaud um, all of our teachers, all of our principals, all of our administrators, and, and all of our support staff for, for all of the work that they are doing to help keep everybody in our, on our campuses and in, at all of our sites safe. Um, I think the, truly the key is continuing the mitigation strategies with fidelity um, and, and staying on it, even though we are all tired. It's tough to keep this up all the time. I know there's been times where, where I personally have said, I've had enough of this, but we know that to stay safe, we need to be doing these things. Um, and, I, and I truly appreciate everyone who has worked so hard um, to make sure that we are doing the right things to keep everyone safe. Um, Ms. Love, do you have any other questions? Um, I just want to be respectful of time because I know that we have another presentation before the business meeting, so I think I can save them. Okay. okay. Mrs. Bruner? Is your microphone on? A few more questions. So the sub situation, what is that looking like? Are we tracking how many um, teachers, maybe this is for Ms. Nance, I'm not sure, um, are having to cover for other teachers and then thus being exposed to another whole group of students? So currently we have um, site subs that are dedicated to each campus. If they're unable to be filled, um, we've been shifting those site designated subs to other sites who may be in need. Um, we really have only had one day so far that was kind of a, a larger impact of, of people out, but it, um, there were several activities going around around the valley, so we think that may have had an impact that day as well as it was a Friday, but we were able to get coverage in. Um, sometimes we send out, you know, one of our academic coaches down here, Ms. Phillips, went out and covered a class for us um, as well when needed. So we're trying to limit the number of times teachers are on preps, um, having to cover. Um, at the elementary, we've avoided splitting classes, which is typically what they do because they don't have consistent prep time. At the secondary level, the teachers right now um, have been ones who have volunteered to go in and do that. Um, and a rotating basis. So um, we are continually looking at that. We're looking with, we're working with ESI right now. We just loaded on another um, 15 to 20 subs this past week um, to send them out to the sites. But overall, we just did some statistics for um, Dr. Castile and um, we had over 2,600 substitutes used last year during the same time period. Um, we were just under 300 this current year. Um, and so, you know, our cost savings there has been wonderful, but um, I think our collaboration among our sites and our um, substitute services here in human resources has been really strong. I mean, every morning we're on and people are shifting support to where it's needed to help um, work with our staff who are in need. So would you say that it is significantly less than in other years where teachers are having to cover? Yes. Um, we can get I don't more need exact numbers, yeah. oh, it's okay. okay. I just wanted to know generally. And we will be hiring more permanent subs at the semester like we typically do with our student teachers. Um, could I also find out what percentage of the quarantine students uh, slash families have provided 
evidence of testing. So we saw that there was nine cases where they were positive, but what nine out of how many actually provided us information, whether they were negative or positive? So I'm not sure, um, maybe Mrs. Hartley has additional numbers for um, how many students would have gotten tested and provided us their negative tests. Um, but we've only have the nine that have provided the positive test. We really, it's, it's hard to tell how many of those students that we've quarantined could have tested positive, or excuse me, could have uh, tested negative and didn't tell us. Uh, and again, we don't know if they could have been showing some symptoms and didn't get a test. We just have the numbers that we have and um, we only know of those nine that have tested positive for those that are quarantined. Lindsay, do you have? I'll, I'll just say that, um, you know, a negative test doesn't break a quarantine, so right. they're out 14 days regardless. Right. So a lot of the times, even if parents are getting uh, their kids tested, you know, just out of um, wanting to be safe and, and know, they don't always provide that to us because it's not required uh, upon return. What right. we would need is a positive test because sometimes that changes their dates that they would be able to come back. But if the person thinks I'm going to be quarantined 14 days anyway, they may not tell you about the positive test, right? It's very true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and so. Can I just actually, if, if a student mm -hmm. tests positive, the county would notify us. Um, it may not be within the 14 days, but the county yeah. does notify us if a student tests positive. So we would eventually be able to identify that student um, and know that they tested positive. So yeah, we would have we would eventually find kid? out. Yeah, it's a mm -hmm. mandatory oh, yeah. report, so that would mm -hmm. would come through there. But it's not it doesn't necessarily come from the parents. And and we don't know how many have tested and how many haven't, right? That's not something we ask or anything of our quarantine kids. Okay. Um. So I I don't know. I think was there were there more questions before we. I think those are probably, if no one else has additional questions, um, I want to again thank you very much for um, presenting the plan. Um, Dr. Castillo. I know you're going to go to the next presentation if you ladies want to go up. Um, so. Can I review what I took notes at as follow up and suggestions yes, from the board? Yes, that would be wonderful. Uh, you want us to explore expanding virtual options for some of our students or parents who feel the need to self quarantine? like information on the average age of our staff and we can get that to you we just need to push a button or two and uh, supports uh, human resources uh, work work better to get garner teacher input and in, in, uh, their thoughts on some of these plans and we have worked as uh, one of the gentlemen said with our leadership our association leadership and have asked her to help us engage more teachers uh, Check on the quarantining in other districts so uh, that we're not quarantining teachers who are exposed and would like to do some work in that area. We look at the um, age of the school, I'm sorry, the percentage that we would uh, put a school in closure temporarily based on the size of school. You used ACP, so we'll have a conversation about that. The staffing, the class sizes, there are more we can do to help um, take some of the pressure off. So if there's anything else, please email me. I'd, we'll, we will be meeting on these suggestions, and I know Donna ha will have more than I. So, but thank you. I, we I didn't guess get a chance uh, to do comments. So will we have comments later on that, or because we just did I'm, questions? So I don't know. Usually we do questions first, then and summer comments. Um, uh, you want to do I, it at the? At we your, could do it at the end. Okay. Or, sure. Whenever. Um, I guess I just have one additional question is when would this, uh, when do we start implementing this? We would start, our plan would be to start immediately. We're watching those numbers very closely. Okay. And thank well, you. we want to communicate with the community, and I believe we have seven or 800 that have been watching this presentation. Okay. We'll get something out to them by Friday, the entire community. Thank you. Next, um, we have a, st our st a study session on integrated units, and I believe Dr. Edgar is going to uh, uh, start us off this evening. Yes. Good evening. I'm going to get closer. Oh, maybe I won't. Maybe I'll scoot back. That's kind of loud. So good, good evening, uh, Madam President, Dr. Castillo, members of the board. 
I'm here representing uh, an, a very large team um, at the Instructional Resource Center because the integrated units are, uh, it's been a labor of love. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we created integrated units for our elementary students in Chandler Unified School District. And I brought members of my team um, in the Instructional Resource Center with me. I have Ms. Jenna Phillips, who is our elementary science instructional coach, also assisted in substituting, as Dr. Nance had shared. We do a little bit of everything to support. And then I also have Assistant Director Katie Moe. She's our Assistant Director of uh, Chandler Online Academy, Elementary Connect. But previously, she was an instructional coach at the IRC and really was instrumental in the creation of the integrated unit. So I want to make sure she came back and was able to speak to uh, the process that we, we went through to make sure that we had integrated units uh, up and rolling. So. I'm excited to have them here tonight, and hopefully we'll get through this process. We have uh, changed it just slightly to, uh, because of time, and then we will have questions at the end, too. So, oh, well, that is not what I want to do. There we go. So first we wanna talk about why integration at the elementary sites. So in 2018-2019, our ADE adopted new science and social science standards. And what was a little bit different between the previous social science and science standards was that if you look at the visual on the left-hand side, previously we were really focusing instructionally on the remembering, the understanding piece. Really, it was recall. And so we wanted to provide a more comprehensive piece uh, for our students because the standards changed just enough to where we focused on the science component of phenomenon, the storyline for uh, social science. So we looked at different aligned frameworks and resources because we really want to design something for CUSD with instructional intentionality to make sure that we created our own piece because the resources out there that we attempted to bring in and really see if they align to aid the standards and what we were trying to do here in Chandler Unified School District for our elementary students didn't really fit what we wanted to do in the instructional model we wanted to provide for our students. We wanted to look at windows. We want to provide windows and mirrors, looking for the diversity, the opportunity for connection. We want to look at access, making sure that there's access to materials for all of our different sites uh, in the elementary schools. A variety of assessments and knowledge uh, application components, so moving from that remembering and understanding piece to evaluation and creation so that there's more meaningful instructional uh, pieces for our science and social science in the elementary setting. So the two frameworks that were decided upon were the three-dimensional science and the C3 social science, which very much aligned with what AD provide, ADE provided us. So we looked at this and we said, you know what, we need to, we really wanted to focus on the inquiry-based piece. We want to have discourse amongst our students, make sure that they're doing more of the talking than the teachers so that there's quality uh, quality understanding amongst our students. Focusing on the college career and civic life focus, speaking to the acquisition and application of the ideas as they relate to the learner based upon the standard that has been provided. And promoting understanding in that bigger picture. So really, if we want to focus on something tonight, it would be the engagement factor of what integrated units uh, provide for our students. So the 5E e model of instruction is something that we, in fourth quarter as well as first quarter when we were in virtually, we really focus on the 5E e model of instruction for all of our lessons in Chandler Unified School District in elementary. So focusing on how we first explain, elaborate, engage, explore, and evaluate. So hitting all those components that really go into the critical thinking pieces and allows for differentiation. So for those students that need to be uh, pulled in and have a little more of that elaboration, or if we can evaluate at a greater level and have different discourse with our, our students that really want to expand and evaluate and, and move forward. So anytime we try to plan something at the Instructional Resource Center, we take into account all the different stakeholders, but most importantly, uh, our students, what they're receiving, but the teachers as well. Um, it's easy sometimes for us when you are removed from that classroom to say we would like this to happen and this to happen and this to happen um, for teachers to really carry out these quality instructional practices we wanted to align some of these pieces so there are efficiencies built into the integrated units that we're, we will present to you tonight so standards focused first and foremost we are standards focused taking in the science and social science components integrating when we certainly could because it was a natural piece so making sure that we have those meaningful connections 
Um, alignment to high yield instructional strategies. So we have certain high yield instructional strategies, uh, evaluation and reflection, uh, the cognitive task analysis that happens through the conversations that the teachers have been trained in. Um, ELP standards, ELP stands for English language proficiency. So also with some new state models, we have the opportunity to do uh, to teach our English language learners in this setting as well using these particular integrated unit maps. So that's been something that's exciting that with the efficiencies, not only is it science and social science, we have the English language proficiency component as well. And something I threw I throw in there because uh, as a former administrator for many years, the certified evaluation alignment, we were also able to take these the different instructional strategies because the focus is really not dependent upon a resource. It's the instructional strategy that the teacher is utilizing to deliver the instruction. So we created a look for document um, that aligns to our uh, evaluation. So it was very easy for our administrators as well to look at these integrated units to observe and align them to the evaluation piece. Something I forgot to say was that we are in year two of our science and social science. Um, we have had an integrated unit 1.0 training last year. It was very successful. And we've had an integrated unit 2.0 training this year for our teachers. And we also had a mini um, PD for our administrators, our principals as well. So we were trying to make sure that we hit all the different pieces so that there was a general understanding of the reason why we went to integrated units and so that there was some excitement as well. So the working product, we have a visual here and I'm going to let uh, Ms. Phillips and Ms. Mo continue speaking a little bit more uh, about this piece, but I do just want to share that the, these foundational components were created by many different people. Um, this map was created by EdTech, was able to help us put this in a nice, uh, a nice layout and the um, coaches will share with you what that layout looks like a little bit, a little bit later. But we're just very excited that we're able to do this and also be able to do this, not just in person, but also we are able to purchase resources, multiple resources, not necessarily a textbook, but they are all virtual. So if we really think about because nobody knew uh, at the time when we were going through this that COVID-19 would happen and we'd be using Google Classroom and we'd have Google Meets. Um, so a lot of the resources that we purchased for integrated units already had capabilities to be inputted into Google Classroom as well as some of those pieces that were all virtual. So we couldn't have planned it any better um, for our staff and we actually saw when we went to virtual, a lot of our staff utilized integrated units even more so than they did before because we did do a slow rollout with it being a two-year implementation process. So with this working product as a visual, I'm gonna let Jenna Phillips and Ms. Katie Mo come up here and share. Thank you, Jessica. When we're looking at this beautiful display, um, there's a couple different things that I want you to take note of. First is the three colors represented, and this is a primary teacher lesson built in itself. We've got blue. Blue stands for social science standalone lessons. We've got yellow. Those are science standalone lessons, and you guessed it, blue and yellow make green. The integrated units are green. So with that, we, we are able to, with a quick visual, look and see for the scope of the year, a grade level would have a few different units. Some of them are standalone, some of them are integrated. And the reason that we did that was because we did not want to force an integration where it did not fit. And we're going to talk just a little bit about how we created those connections between the content areas. But I did want to focus on the idea that we didn't want to force anything. We wanted it to be an organic, real world connection between the two content areas. Our focus is on science and social science, but we also integrate other content areas in as well. Um, on the bottom portion of this, we've got weeks. So we have an estimated number of weeks that each of these units would take. And we're gonna take a deep dive into what a teacher has access to so that you can all see. But the other piece in here is that when we look at um, what is actually on the roadmap and on those pieces, we've got two main components, and that is the cross-cutting concept. That's what we are calling our content connector. That is, um, there, there are seven cross-cutting concepts that are represented in the world of science. They are big thematic pieces that connect our worlds together. And when we read them and understood that we're looking at patterns and cause and effect and systems and system models, we could really see a very strong connection between science and social science. And so that is the bridge that kind of um, helped tie everything together. And then we also focus on big ideas and essential questions. Every single unit 
has an essential question that ties in the cross-cutting concept. And at the end of every single unit, the student should be, an be, be able to answer those essential questions based on the lessons and the learning that they've conducted. So I'm gonna escape out of here. And we'll pull this up. I'm gonna show you quickly. On um, our CUSD website under curriculum, under science or social studies, social science curriculum, you can find access to these. You would go in under departments curriculum or under academics curriculum to get there. And you'll scroll down and these beautiful roadmaps are there. You can select the roadmap that you'd like and it will take you to um, a page that has this layout. And then from there, you can select whatever unit you would like to explore. You can click right on it. I will say that in order to get this far, everyone can see all of our beautiful work. But to get deep down into our resources, our lessons, all of the, the pieces that we put our human capital into, it's password protected. So um, let's see, we'll go into maps and geography here. And once we go here, we are able to do a deep dive. Now this is the unit of study in its entirety. It's very small um, up on the screen, but when you really dive in, you can see all of the different pieces. So we start up at the top with the amount of weeks, the essential question, and then as multiple teams, as Dr. Edgar has said, we had an accordion model of teachers coming in, so we had flex teachers in and out um, throughout the two-year process, and we're continuing to meet with groups um, virtually in terms of feedback and different pieces. Um, but we've bro broken down the standards, figured out what questions do we need to have these kids answer in order to be successful in answering the essential question. We've looked at all the concepts, vocabulary, and a big piece of this is the disciplinary skills and processes in social science and the um, science and engineering practices in science. And those two areas are the, those skills that we really want kids to build. And we broke those into the standards. As you can see here, we have the ELD, ELP standards that Dr. Edgar referenced. Part of this is um, we've listed the standards and then there's a supporting document that is being created that teachers can go to and have a really nice matrix that's going to show what um, units all, and lessons all of these standards are covered in and what standards they align to. We have our student-friendly objectives for teachers so that they'll know exactly what is going to be covered within that lesson. We have our content vocabulary and our academic vocabulary laid out because we know the importance of both of those. And then down here we have our um, adopted resources and we also have tied in our journeys because that's a big um, portion of our elementary curriculum and how we can tie that into the English language arts as well as the, the materials that we have purchased um, for science and social science if we had them. And then again, open ed resources. And then down here is where we're gonna be able to tap into our lesson. And within that lesson, I'm gonna click on it in just one moment, it's gonna take you into the step-by-step -step of how we can make science and social science come to life in our classrooms. We've also provided um, all of the formative assessment grading opportunities that are happening within each of those lessons, as well as the summative assessment. And we use another one of our amazing resources, Define STEM which is a performance, um, performance type assessment, which we know is best practice in science and social science. So students are actually able to make their learning come to life in some sort of a design thinking or project-based learning experience. So I'm gonna actually click on one of these for us, and that is going to be lesson three, floating down the river. I'm gonna open that up. And then this is um, one of our lessons. And Jenna, do you wanna go through the So the formatting is set up the same way for all the grade levels and all the units. Um, so they're pretty easy to follow and everything that a teacher would need is right there. Um, it starts with a, a lesson objective and then the list of the standards that would be covered by this lesson. You'll notice here that um, these two standards are our science standards um, and these four down here are our social science standards. This was a, an example of a, a really easy way to marry both um, earth science standards and geography standards for social science. And so within this one lesson, we're hitting, um, we're teaching two subject areas within one lesson. We provide uh, materials for teachers. If they're online, there's a link there for them to access. Um, time suggestions that we've provided. 
um, the vocabulary that they'll find as they move through the lesson, along with suggested resources if they need additional or they're looking for something during reading time, um, they can pull out some of the additional resources as well. Then just as Dr. Edgar had mentioned, um, we've set up our lesson plans in the 5E model. And 5E isn't something that has been new, but it is something that um, is a nice way for teachers to structure the lesson so that we keep kids engaged in, in science and social science when they're learning. We are going to model for you. Um, we we're going to have you do it, but we're kind of short on time. Um, we're going to model for you one of them that we had um, for students to do, just so you can see what um, what the the flow is for this lesson. Now, obviously, we're going to kind of compact it, but we're going to show you uh, the engagement, the exploration, and a piece of the explanation piece tonight. So let me. So this is one of our resources, Mystery Science. It does have a Google Classroom piece. So um, if students are learning at home, teachers can assign it into Google Classroom. Um, that is the one thing that we found with a lot of our resources. Um, whoever was putting them together um, stepped up to the plate right at the beginning of the year and provided us some resources that we could use right away. So students, as they're starting a lesson, um, an engagement part is something that we want students to get excited about or think about something in the natural world. And so um, we may not show this part to students, but um, we're going to start with just a little video clip um, to get you thinking. And remember, you are second graders right now. Hi, it's Doug. When I was a kid about your age, there was this forest near where I lived. I love to go exploring in the forest. I'd spend hours out there, and I'd always find interesting things. Like one time, I saw a baby owl up in a tree. Sometimes I would see deer out there. There was always something new to find. One animal I really hoped I would find was a frog. I love frogs, even to this day. They're one of my favorite animals. My dad knew this about me, and so one day in the spring, my dad said to me, you know, Doug, it's springtime. Did you know there's a place in the forest where we can find some tadpoles? Baby frogs, like these. My dad said, yeah, you could catch a few, raise them here at home in a fish tank, and then release them back into the forest when they grow into frogs. I was so excited. Could we really do that? Where would we find them? So my dad took me on a hike back into the forest, but this time to a part of the forest I hadn't explored yet. I could see that up ahead of us was this water. Maybe it was a pond, maybe it was a lake, I couldn't tell. As we got closer, my dad helped me carefully get close to the edge of the water and dip a little plastic bottle in to try to catch some of the tadpoles in it. But I accidentally dropped the bottle in the water. Oh no. Well, that's okay, I said. I think I can get it back out of the water again using a stick. But as I went to do that, that's when I realized the plastic bottle was moving. In just a few seconds, it had floated a few feet down from me. I had to run after it. Finally, I caught it. But that's when I had noticed for the first time the bottle had moved because the water in this place was moving. I hadn't even noticed that before. I said to my dad, Dad, why is the water doing that? It's moving. Now, I already knew that in some places the water moves. Like, I'd seen waves at the ocean before. Waves are water that rise up, go down, and crash against the shore. But this movement wasn't like waves. Instead, this movement was in a line, moving constantly from one place to another place further down. It wasn't crashing against the shore. It was going from here down this way. It was flowing. My dad smiled and said, Doug, that's a river. That's what a river does. A river flows. In fact, people love to float down rivers. Sometimes in the summer when it's nice and warm, people will put inflatable tubes in and sit on them and then just float down the river just for fun. I thought about this some and said, wow, so does that mean if you put a boat in there, you wouldn't even have to paddle? My dad explained, that's right, you wouldn't have to. As long as you're okay going the same direction that the river flows, the river will just carry you like a train. 
that's what rivers do. But why? What makes the water move like this? What causes a river to flow? So during the time that students spend watching, there are breaks where teachers can allow students to um, discuss with one another. And we've come up with lots of different ways that this can happen, especially um, right now. But um, this highlights one of the important pieces of the new science standards, and that is from um, looking at phenomena. So I might show this in a classroom and say to students, wow, that river is flowing really fast, and have them make some observations about it, um, but finally get to the question of why? Why is that river flowing? Because as we go through as, um, and look at things that happen in nature, we're making those observations that prompt questions. And that's really what we want to have students doing rather than us as teachers telling them why something happens like that. So we might spend a few minutes having students um, discuss why, why does it run? Maybe they hadn't really thought of that before. It seems like a simple question, um, but it might stump them. And so giving them some time with this phenomena. <laughs> Why do you think, David? <laughs> and, and second graders might, and it's a great way for teachers to do some formative assessment right there on the spot and figure out where exactly their kids' understanding is. We know um, that there's lots of misconceptions that students come to a classroom with in science. And so um, that discourse that we're having students do tell the teacher a lot about where they are at in their learning. So after they have that discussion, um, a part of the Mystery Science episode has them look at a map and talk about, well, here are some rivers across, the, across North America. And um, the arrows show what direction they move and have the students come up with some ideas about what do they all have in common, which they all end up out here at a water source, at an ocean, at a gulf. Um, you can add in some of that vocabulary as you're, as you're teaching that. But it still doesn't answer the question why. So that's when we have the students decide they're going to build a model. Can I build? Do you want me to build? OK. So the great thing about this activity is it uses um, materials that are easy to find in a classroom because um, prep in science um, takes a lot of time. And so this really just uses regular copy paper um, and a printout if you want it. Um, the Mystery Science walks the kids through it step by step. Um, and they do it in a way where if you were working with a partner, each partner has a job. And then they have a discussion that they do along with it. So um, as you walk through, you put a piece of paper over your fist. We talk about how this kind of looks like land a little bit if we're looking from above. Um, it has um, a high point, some low points. Might show students some pictures. What are some things that you notice about these mountains? Are they similar or different to your mountains? And then um, this is kind of the fun part for the kids. They take a blue marker. Sorry, they attach it to their paper first. <laughs> then they use a blue marker. And in a minute, we're going to have it rain on our mountain. And so um, we want to kind of highlight, where, where will the rain hit on our mountain? And it's going to be those top um, peaks in our mountain as it's coming down the side. Katie's doing a very nice job. If you're working with a partner, one partner would get to do it, and then the other partner would get to do it as well. This is a great out, outside activity. Um, especially when you're working with water. <laughs> Quality marker. <laughs> <laughs> and then, um, again, you would have a conversation with students. How do our mountains look similar? How are, they, or how are they different? What do we notice about the blue markings on all of our different mountains? And then the teacher would move around um, and spray, or students could have, um, we have enough for students and groups to have water bottles. Right now, it would be preferable that teachers did it. And they would spray the top of the mountain. Well, as long as you're using um, washable markers, that runs like a river. And so um, it starts to, um, are you going to spray it? Well, <laughs> well I, I think we'll use, we actually have baggies for, if we you were, like, yeah. take it home and do it yourself. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Can you go back to the previous slide? No, one more. So that's why it looks like it's running uphill. It's not. It's a mountain in through Canada. It looks and like it's running in the wrong way, but it's because of the visual. I can see it's a mountain. So, so after can... students go through and they do oh. the, they build the model and they spray it and the water runs like a river, then we talk about how how is are the how's the water running um, with relationship to the mountain. And so you want to lead them to the answer that there must be mountains here. And at the end of um, this mystery, they actually put in both the Rocky Mountains and the Appalachians so that students can see that the starting points of these rivers all happen in mountains and they flow down towards um, the ocean or a Gulf of Mexico. I'm glad you made the connection. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> and like there's no bad artist in the class. There's really no, you know, it's no, absolutely not. Um, and so then following this, um, one of the strategies that we used in our 301 classes last year and then subsequently wrote into these units um, was an idea of chat stations. So it gets kids up, moving around the room, talking about what they did with other students, um, adding sticky notes to posters. Um, there's other ways that we can do it in the digital wor world using Padlet. But we want students to think deeply about what they ju just did, not um, recalling some fact that they might have learned about a river or a, a mountain. Can I add something to that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I also wanted to say that we've written in these high yield instructional strategies into the lessons as a way to help support teachers with using those high quality teaching um, opportunities. So we pulled these from some, actually we used these from some of our 301 classes that we had taught on highly effective strategies for teachers. It's just yet another way to layer in some new teaching opportunities for teachers. Sneaking PD in there without them knowing. So then at the end, we would wrap up the entire lesson with having um, students do something with, why do you think the river flows? And now they should have built up enough information. They built it up. I didn't give it to them about how the river flows. And so that would kind of wrap up um, this maybe three or four days um, long lesson. Um, but at the end, they can answer their own question. I don't have to do it for them. Okay. <laughs> um, when we um, built these, we used the term living documents. So these are living units because they are teacher created by teachers here within CUSD. We've put a lot of time in this, but on paper, it might look one way. And in reality, when we implement, it might look a completely different way. So we've, we've um, relied on our teachers to implement these lessons and then provide us feedback. So we've added these, um, this whole feedback feature for teachers and we've gotten feedback, utilized their changes, implemented them into the units, and then we'll continue the cycle ongoing. So sometimes teachers will say, hey, I found an additional amazing resource or I created this graphic organizer that would be perfect for this. And so we're, we're using the term living because nothing in here is set in stone right now. We want to always adapt and change based on what we know is best practice and what we know works best for kids in the classroom. So we just have had um, a whole bunch of different uh, pieces of feedback and we're continuously asking teachers, please submit your feedback. We know it's an extra layer, an extra thing for them to do, but it really does inform our instruction of how we're going to roll these units out. Um, and when we started virtually, we started to get feedback from teachers that would say, this works well virtually, this doesn't. Um, this is how I adapted it. Um, so it was kind of neat to see that they were still providing us information so that we could support them. So um, this is one of our um, sessions we had with teachers. Uh, we went through having writers. And then last year, before everything um, went south, we brought in reviewers. So reviewers were teachers that had used it that had um, feedback that they could provide that went through all of our feedback and then made those tweaks um, to the existing documents. Um, I pulled this email um, from one of our teachers. I just thought it was, um, it made us realize that what we're doing is, is working and that teachers appreciate it. Um, 
it's just a teacher that's towards the end of her career and she doesn't usually step up to do things like this, but um, she wanted to be part of it because she knows it's good for kids. And like I said, we do have baggies for you to take home if you wish, because I knew that you would really enjoy this, Mr. Evans. Uh, I knew that everybody would enjoy this, because really when we're talking about numbers and the COVID data, we're talking about students and how they access instruction and how do we do that. So I wanted to add a few pictures here. Um, and this was obviously the picture you saw uh, a moment ago was actually last year's uh, professional development, because as you see, we were not social distance. So I want to make sure that that is out there, that that was a previous picture, um, as well as this for right now. But as you can see, there's some standalone pieces that students can do. This is a sound uh, unit and all those different pieces, um, some of it, the teachers collected as far as the materials, but we are doing the best that we possibly can do. And we have a, our work cut out for us making sure that we replenish the materials too, um, because some sites are, have easier access than others for parents to volunteer and bring certain things. Um, we've spent many a times, Jenna spent many a days at, at the Goodwill collecting felt and other different things to make sure that we have the materials for teachers and for students. If a teacher uh, sends us an email, we will certainly find that material, make sure that they get it. Um, and they, the joy on the students' faces with, as far as the engagement piece, the discovery that they are making the connections is less talking, less direct instruction, more doing and making those connections. So with we keep talking about high yield instructional strategies. So what those are, are the instructional strategies that can be used across education, across the disciplines, to make sure that we have better student outcomes, student achievement. So um, in the middle here, so I have the two pictures of these, these cute kids. Um, and then in the middle, we have a student work, actually, that was submitted uh, through Elementary Connect Chandler Online Academy. We're doing um, a secondary piece now as far as secondary look at how can we also use what we've done in integrated units, transfer that to Chandler uh, Online Academy, uh, Elementary Connect. And so we're doing that and doing it very well. And it doesn't hurt that Ms. Mo happens to be the assistant director at Elementary Connect. So it's definitely a passion of hers as well as the districts. But I also just want to share one piece, too, because it, it impacts our teachers, as you saw, um, as Ms. Phillips stated, that the teacher um, quote that we had up there was somebody who was reinvigorated by being part of this professional development and being able to teach this way and teach maybe a little bit differently instead of the um, report out type piece that science and social science used to be. So that was fantastic. But it also, it also affects our, our families and our students. And I shared this email um, with some members of the cabinet because Anytime we can get a fantastic email, we just need to share. And I feel uh, so, I feel compelled to read it to you out loud for those that can't necessarily re read it themselves right now. So it says, hello. I want to say thank you for allowing and giving blank the time and space to share who he is and where he comes from. He has taken this time to reflect and think about the people of Mesa Verde. He couldn't believe people like himself no longer lived in a community or a village like this, like his. He's grateful for what he has learned about his own people from Acoma Pueblo and Gila River Indian community during this time. In my experience going through school, I've heard teachers say Native American history isn't important or doesn't matter. So I appreciate you teaching Native American indigenous people history to your students because it does matter. For a child like Blank who wears his hair long because of his Gila River culture to teach and share who he is gives him value and makes others accepting. Thank you, Ms. Blank, my family and I appreciate you. So it's moments like those that make all the hard work of two years, many different people, uh, many different teachers. Uh, that's what makes the difference right there. It makes a difference for our parents. It makes a difference for our students. So I'm, we're very pleased that we could share this with you tonight. And we are prepared to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, doc Dr. Edgar and um, Katie and Jenna. Um, truly appreciate it. Um, I don't personally have any questions, but I, I just a comment. Um, I think this is fantastic because um, all of these cross-curricular connections really help, I think, kids' brains work a whole lot better and, and learn and retain the information that they need uh, to know. Um, Hands-on experience um, are great things for them to do to get actively involved in something, and, and they all have, and these lessons have meaning. So, um, Mr. Evans, did you want to participate and yes. do a mountain? Uh, yeah, can I take, have some of that stuff to go? Um, but well, uh, real quick, so what, what I was picturing, and actually I have one question, but can you get me back to it? Um, the certified evaluation piece, but before I, thank you, but before I go there, um, this is, 
kind of reminiscent of a program that started down in Vail, Beyond Textbooks, but he, he kind of did something really interesting with this because the, the inquiry-based instruction piece is awesome, right? But then there's a pedagogy to it because you're tying in a lot of cultural pieces that, that then can be shared with all the students, right? Um, and like you said, as it relates to the learning, your slide two is like phenomenal. I'm gonna steal this. And then the, the depth of learning piece, what I didn't understand is how it goes from blue to yellow to green. Like what's the timeline for that kind of stuff? Because the other piece is the teacher buy-in or the educator buy-in because they have the ability to, to create and, and mold this the way they want it to work. But a lot of people who are in elementary who might not be really strong in the sciences, right? This really gives them a, a, a kind of a pathway and a guide to get them to having fun themselves and then sharing with their students. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so what does that pathway look like? Because you said it's a couple, some of them can be a couple weeks and... Sure, so I'm going to just address the, the timeline and then I'll have Ms. Mo come up and discuss a little bit further about your secondary question. But right now, if you look at the bottom, it says four weeks. So four weeks for this unit one, it's a civics communities and this is a little bit of a blurry graphic, uh, but you can also go without a password protected piece onto our website. So four weeks, this is all of quarter one. There's two units within quarter one. One is four weeks, one is five weeks. And those are estimates. We know that we through differentiation, it might take a little bit longer, a little bit less. Um, and there might be some other pieces you need to add in between. So we, let the, we really let the teachers have their professional judgment to decipher, but really that's kind of a, a pacing guide. So if, as you can see, quarter one, two, three, and four, and then the suggested weeks down here, we did a very short lesson for you and we compacted it even that much more today. Um, but there is so much more if you actually dive in and look at the resources that you can do. Um, there's multiple standards, we just hit one piece. So I'm hoping that answers your timeline question. Can you repeat the second question? And then I'll let Ms. Mo come up and answer it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what we did is I'll add, actually not have Ms. Mo answer that. I'll answer it if you're okay with that. Uh, certified, certified evaluation alignment, what we wanted to do is as a principal, I took my experience as a principal and said, you know, in elementary and in, in many, not just elementary, but specifically the teachers are teaching all these different content areas. And so as a principal, I wanna be the best at what I do and make sure that I'm looking at what are the high yield instructional strategies. And then to have a document that takes the high yield instructional strategies that aligns it to Marzano's evaluation piece, I'm able to say, okay, it's almost like my study guide a little bit, because to be a master at every single content to the depth of what our teachers do in the classroom can be a challenge at points in time. So it was just another helpful document for our administrators to look at to align the instruction with the evaluation and to see that we're hitting certain points that are in the evaluation that specifically address high yield instructional strategies so it, it sticks and we're making better connections that, um, through instruction. Thank you, Dr. Edgar. Um, at this point in time, since it is time for us to start our business meeting, um, I'm going to cut off questions. But if one of you would be willing to stay um, to, it, well, let me first ask, does the board have additional questions that they would like to ask? Yes. yes. You, you do, okay. Um, uh, Ms. Love, do you have any other, do you have any questions that you will like to ask later? on this? Um, I don't have any other questions, but thank you so much for the presentation. It was great. Okay. Could thank we you for just the opportunity. Have, could we just have one of you stay so that we can answer um, Mr. Evans' questions during our information section of the meeting? Certainly. I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yes. Madam President, I just want to say thank you. I had asked Jessica to, all we do is live and breathe COVID, and I wanted the board to see there's, there's so much going on behind the scenes. and. Uh, they're remarkable, and it's a Chandler product, and I'm just so proud of them. I wanted to share it with all of you. I'm glad you did, um, and I think that it's it's a great way to um, really show what's really working with our students um, uh, at school. So thank you. We appreciate all your work and all the um, teachers' work too that have helped you uh, to refine this and um, you know get additional suggestions. Thank you.